He decides what may be suitable. He will contact a financial institution outside the jurisdiction, maybe Far East, Europe, and Latin America. He'll get the fact sheets and the brochures from them. And then he'll select a package. So he may select for a fund that big, 250. He may select 30. He will send the package to Mauritania, enclosing the fact sheets with a range of bonds, structured notes, instruments, and other investments. He'll go to his client in Mauritania. He'll advise about uh, the client. He will then choose, let's say, 15 products. Now, at that point, is it realistic to say, the advisor says, thank you very much. I suggest you contact the 15 institutions yourself. You get their forms. Perhaps you can go to China, Belgium, and Brazil, meet them direct. They're sending all these forms, which you'll have to fill out yourself, and you can sort out the process. That isn't how it works. The client, in those circumstances, will say, look, he'll either walk away and say, these people are useless, or complain and say, look, I've come to you to advise and arrange all of this. I do not want to deal with all these different financial institutions and go through all that rigmarole. What the client expects is the advisor to liaise with the financial institutions, sort out the forms, help with the applications, and advise it. And, the, and what will happen in, in the real world, the, the firm will get the forms from the 15 institutions, he will advise the clients on those investments, he will act as a conduit between the client and the institution, and will handle any issues that arise between those institutions and investments. And the, he will get commission on those investments either one or two ways. Either you have a, already an agency arrangement or a formal tie whereby it's agreed that if I refer business, I get X percent. Or he'll have an ad hoc arrangement saying, I've got this client, he's got $10 million here, he wants to place it in these structured notes, I, I want my usual rate of commission, which will range for anything anywhere between one and a half, maybe up to three and a half percent, but sometimes you'll see it at five percent. That's all very uh, normal. I, think, I fear it may demonstrate my lack of grasp of the documentation in this case. But take the sim simple uh, structure you talk about, that uh, an entity in Dubai which is authorized to give advice yeah. is approached by a client, and uh, the client says he wants X, the advice is to do something slightly different, and the advice is accepted by the client. Yeah. And so the, the Dubai entity then has to go to his joint venture partner to ask if they will put together a product in order to achieve uh, what the client wants. Yeah, it, it, on that, that particular type of scenario, yeah, if he's, if he's got a, a joint venture with someone yeah. else, he can go there. Now, he can go I mean, elsewhere. As I understand it, that, that is, in a sense, the structure here. Yeah. Uh, well, the graph is wanted the X. There's a dispute as to what they wanted, of course. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the Saracen Alpin uh, approached uh, Saracen for, to put a product together which met the client's requirements. Correct. Right. Now, what is the document that emanates from uh, Saracen Alpin to Saracen which identifies? what the client wanted. Jonathan, you're not talking about the indicative term sheets. I don't know what, I, I'm just asking the question. Oh, the, the exercise here yes. is that Saracen is approached to put together a product in order to satisfy the requirements of Saracen Alkin's client. Correct. And so initially, there's got to be a communication from Dubai to Switzerland saying, could you th think about this? What do you suggest we do with regard to a client who wants X? Can you make a proposal for us or to him? Yeah. And then, and then, now, which, which is the document that contains that request? Can you just keep what I'll do is I'll ask my senior to, right. to keep the references to the I mean, emails. one of the features of this case is, uh, remains extraordinary to me in the, the absence of any documentation by 
Sarah's can help him as to what to, was going on in their various meetings. Um, but that, that applies not just to Saracen and Alpin. One would have thought that the bank in Switzerland, when they're being invited to put together products worth $200 million, would want to know quite a lot of detail of precisely what the client wanted and in great detail as to what uh, he was trying to achieve, uh, in great detail of whether he had the money to make the purchase, whether he was good to meet a margin, and so on and so on. Now, that there is almost no communication in documentary form, unless I've missed it, on those topics between Bank Saracen and the client. There's nothing there, I don't think. What do you, you and between Bank Saracen, so I keep calling them Bank, yes, Bank Saracen Alpin, they call themselves a bank, and Bank Saracen. Uh, on those topics, is there? Because if there is, I, I'd rather miss it. Well, look, perhaps I could just take you, you two for the, to the, um, some of the emails. For example, Bundle H1, yeah. um, tab 111. Tab 101. Tab 111. 11. Yeah. Okay. I haven't looked at this, but okay, thank you. Well, look, it, 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 time. This is this is shortly after the Opal meeting. Yeah. And this is from uh, now to uh, Lernberger. So let me just read it if I can. Some of it's good. And, and, and it's thin, dear. Um, well, can I just take you to Mr. Lernberger's statement that deals with this? It's a, well, no, I won't, I, I'm not really interested in what he says, what he said. I'm more interested in what he wrote. Um, anyway, this is one email which he yeah. sent. But he does also has another example in the next tab, in fact. Sorry? My Lord also has another example in the following tab, 112. Okay. Uh, thank you, yeah. Quite, but although there are, very, there are very few indeed, my Lord is right to know. So we've looked at. There's okay, a well, I, haven't seen, I haven't looked at these before, but they're, they're very helpful. Yeah. I'm just saying. trying to get a feel we'll come, to there's, what sort of. There's 112. Yeah, I've got that. Thank there's you. 115A. 115B. Right, well. Uh, I don't want to waste too much time. If, uh, if your junior could put together a list of the communications between Bank Saracen Alpin and Bank Saracen relating to the uh, nature of the products which the client uh, wanted and which the, the Bank Saracen Alpin given advice, yeah. if they had, uh, and any documents relating to the information provided as to the credit worthiness of the claimants, their ability to meet margin, uh, their experience. Maybe none of these points came forward, but if there are, I would like to see them. So I just take a list of the page numbers. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, but my Lord, if you've got that one, it may be useful just to look at 115B. I've got 115A, uh, B, yes. Because that, that sets out the background of what, what Thank you require. And then perhaps I would like to just take to Mr. Lernberg's statement, just very briefly, my Lord, um, which is in bundle. Um, E2, tab 72. No, just hang on a moment.
at Muller. So if we look at paragraph um, 47 of uh, Mr. Lernberger's statement, Sorry, yeah, E2, E2 sat, tab 72. Well, just at one point is, is that at 47, but before we get to that, we'll, can I just deal with the point? That we have not disclosed the documents relating to credit worthiness because there was no pleaded case against us on the credit itself. So we've looked at Mr. Burnley's statement which refers to the credit process within Switzerland and the processes it would have gone to. Those documents have not been disclosed. Because there was no pleaded issue. Sure, no pleaded case that. There was no pre pleaded case as against us on the credit worthiness of the client, <coughs> saying that well, we shouldn't have taken them on as, as clients. Well, the there's a pleaded case, case against the second, the first two documents. Yeah. Anyway. Would, your, would your documents not be relevant to that? Not, not necessarily, because. They will have their own, as explained by Mr. Burnley. Well, they may have their own, and I just, they, from the point of view of disclosure, they, they may be right, but I'm just slightly surprised that if you have a range of documents, or even only one or two, relating to the credit, or lack of it, of the Karathi family, you say those are not disclosable. Well, I'm surprised by that, but uh, anyway, the point's not being taken, so it doesn't matter. If we look at paragraph 47 of the law, yes. uh, as in, in, this is page 3904, as indicated above, at no stage did I deal directly with the claimants because this role was performed by BSA. I was first informed of the claimant's interest in purchasing products from BSC by Mr. Mayor in April 2007, although at this point in time I was not aware of their identities. This was very much the nature of my role, which was already mentioned above, was to remain in the background and focus on creating products to meet the requirements of clients as communicated by me by the client relationship manager of BSA and its entities. On the 25th of April 2007, following a telephone conversation with Mr. Mayor, I sent an email to Mr. Mayor, Mr. Shriver, whatever it is, enclosing data and graphs of historic right data and an illustration of the payout on the cerebral right basket fee or on USD products. This email is at tab one of the exhibit. Then it says, on the 3rd of May, I exchanged emails with Mr. Mayor in relation to the rate structure. These emails are tab 3 and tab 11. The first email was sent by me to Mr. Mayor following a discussion I had with my colleague, Mr. Anders, in relation to price requests for capital purchase units and real, real estate investment tr uh, trusts. Depending on their issue, CPs are known as capital protected notes, capital guaranteed notes, or similar. At BSC, these structured products were known as cerebral units at the time they key products were purchased. In this email correspondence, I was seeking further information from Mr. Mayor concerning the claimant's product requirements, especially whether the products being considered would be traded simultaneously or not. This would have had an impact on their pricing. As could be seen from my email to the 21st of June 2007, it is also important for me to understand what issue or rating the claimants were prepared to accept because the issue or rating having had an impact on the size of the coupon plate due payments and minimum redemption amount. A lower issue or rating would have permitted higher coupon payments during the term of the product. And I invite the Lord to read 49 and 50, where he deals with the following emails. And I invite you to read right up until paragraph 53. Well, I'll have to read the whole of this. I mean, this is Mr. I'll just reply to your Lordship's yeah. question. Yes, thank you. Mr. Leuenberger. Correct. Um, uh, he'd known Mr. Nair a long time, had he? Well, he first met him in 2006 at yeah. paragraph 45. It said, I first met Mr. Mayor when he visited BSC in Basel 2006. Yeah. Uh, that's what I said. Mr. Wiley, did he know him? No. I don't think he mentioned Mr. Wiley. But okay. right, thank you for that. But did you say that? Helpful introduction. Trouble is, it doesn't have any cross referencing to the, either the call that Okay, thank you. Would, you. would your Lordship want me to provide you a copy of that with the cross-referencing on it? Yes. We I can do that overnight. That would be helpful. Thank you. 
Anyway, thank you for the. I, 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 well, your junior is going to provide a list of the relevant emails, uh, which are presumably in the H1 and H2 series somewhere. That would be the, or H3 or 4, I don't know. It would be helpful to see the, the run of them. Um, the model, look, I was dealing with my Mauritania example where you have a 250 million to invest, he has a client advisor in Dubai, client advisor places that with a number of institutions. I'm saying in the real world, the client would not expect to have direct dealings with uh, the product providers, and that's a very common uh, structure. And the, if you look at the practicality of this, if, if, if for example, the $250 million is, is invested in, let's say, 15 different products. Um, and the investments, let's say, increase globally, uh, let's say, 250 to 300 in uh, 2013. They go from uh, two, 300 million to, let's say, 310 million in 2014. But then the client says, actually, it would have been higher were it not for this Belgian bank product, one of the 15 products you bought. That has gone down by five billion dollars. And then he, is it seriously suggested he can then say, ah, that Belgian bank has breached the pro financial prohibition by me purchasing the, the, that note from that Belgian bank from you. And so what I want to do is just cancel that transaction. I'll get my investment back on that but I'll keep the benefit from the other 14 products bought from the other banks. It, it's just, what I say, it's, it's an unreal uh, world in, in, in where you can effectively hit the, the, the foreign bank in circumstances such as the pre present. And that's why the sort of market commentary on this case is, is that this, this judgment has very far-reaching implications. But the whole idea of having licensing and regulation is to ensure that clients are not left unprotected and their investments are not handled or advised by people who are not qualified to advise them. And that here, there's no regulatory gap because neither firm, we say, is operating outside of any regulator in dealing with the clients. The first fence deal authorised and dealing with the clients and regulating the DIFC, the advisory relationship, and we are authorised and regulated in Switzerland, where the bank accounts, facilities, and the investments are located. My Lord, th th I would like now to take you through the authorities on, in or from the jurisdiction. And this, I start that at paragraph 61 of my skeleton argument. And the, the first case I'd like to take your Lordship and your Excellency to is the Accora uh, decision in Authorities Bundled 5, Tab 28. Yeah, look, what's the proposition that you say Accora establishes? Well, this I mean, case... There are lots, uh, I know that it has its own facts. Well, I just want to know what, what is the proposition which you say we should apply as a matter of law the three to the facts of this case? Firstly, that you must have been carrying on business for a substantial period of time. That's proposition one. Proposition two... What is that an issue here? Well, it may be an issue because it may be an issue as to what... No, when no, charges no, one no, and two... Not at all. I'm going for a long time. Okay. Uh, right, that's a, a substantial period of time. Secondly, they say that the key consideration in deciding whether or not the agent or person within the jurisdiction uh, is um, means that the, the principal outside is carrying on business, is whether or not the person within the jurisdiction can bind the foreign corporation. And we say that's a critical feature and that doesn't apply here because D1 did not have the power to bind D2 contractually. And third proposition from this case is that the fact that the person in the jurisdiction communicates with customers does not mean 
that the foreign corporation is carrying on business within the jurisdiction. So those are the three propositions I derived in this case. And so I'd like to take you to the, the relevant passages in, in, the, in the judgment. Five, tab 28. I'd invite your lordships on, on, on this. I invite your lordship just to read the head note before I take you to the uh, relevant passages. Yeah. Um, if we turn to Lord Justice Buckley's judgment at page. 718. He sets out the, the question to be decided at the beginning of his judgment, and about line 6 I start. The point to be considered is, do the facts show that the corporation is carrying on its business in this country? In determining that question, three matters here ha have to be considered. First, the acts relied upon as showing that the corporation is carrying on business in this country must have continued for a sufficiently substantial period of time. That is the case here. Next, it is essential that these acts should have been done at some fixed place of business. If the acts relied on, on in this case, amount to carrying on in business, there is no doubt that these, those acts were done at a fixed place of business. The third essential, and one which is always more difficult to satisfy, is that, is, is that the corporation must be here by a person who carries on business to the corporation in this country. <coughs> it is not enough to show that the corporation has an agent here. He must be an agent who does the corporation's business for the corporation in this country. And then uh, he cites the Sakharin case, which I'm not sure if I need to take you to. And then on page 720, uh, in the middle of the first paragraph, he cites the facts in Grant and Anderson, where the defendants were domiciled and resident in Scotland and carried on business there. They employed an agent in London to obtain orders for them, whose remuneration consisting of commission on business done by him. The agent occupied an office in London, the rent of which he paid, and his duty was to receive and transmit orders to the defendants of Glasgow. He had no authority to conclude contracts with the defendants, except on express instruction. It was held that the defendants did not carry on their business in London. That case seems to me to be very close to the present case. And then he deals with the facts of the present case. And then at 721, at the first new paragraph, where after he's dealt with the facts, line four, in my opinion, the defendants are not here by the alter ego who does business for them here, or who is competent to buy them in any way. They are not doing business here by, per, by a person, but through a person. That person has to communicate with them, and the ultimate determination resulting in the contract is made not by the agents in London, but by the defendants in Sweden. It follows from this that one of the essential elements which must be present before a written can be set is, is not uh, present. And then uh, Lord Justice Fillimore at 724. And then at Fillimore at, at line 4 deals with the Sacker Incorporation case. He says, there's no doubt the strong case and possibly Possibly the decision goes a little further than some of the previous cases. But it does not, in my opinion, go as far as we are asked to do in this case. The important distinction between the two cases is the Sacrament Corporation case. The agent in London had authority to enter into a contract on behalf of the defendants without submitting the orders to them for their approval. Whereas in the present case, the agents have not that authority. Their duty merely being to submit the orders to the defendants until they signify their approval, no contract can be entered into. And he says in these circumstances it seems impossible to say that the position of the defendants is in any way analogous to that of a person residing or a firm carrying on business in this uh, country. And if I could just 
elaborate on the three points I derived from this. The, the first is the business must have been carrying on for a substantial business of time. And I say that in those circumstances, you need to look at each tranche separately and the acts relied upon. And you may conclude that for tranches one and two in June and July 2007, are not this requirement is clearly not met, but it's more debatable in relation to tranche three in February 2008. And this requirement is consistent with general... But this wasn't the only business that was they were no. doing, was it? No. no. And this requirement is consistent with general 2.3.1c, uh, which requires regularity and con continuity. Um, we say the complaint in this case is about three tranches in a book of investment and not how the second defendant operates with a large number of clients and transactions. The, the second point is that one of the key considerations was whether the person in the jurisdiction could buy in the foreign corporation. And we say that's a critical factor uh, and that that is not present here. And the third is, as per Lord Justice Buckley at page 71, uh, the fact that the person in the jurisdiction communicates with customers does not mean that the foreign cor corporation is carrying on business within the jurisdiction. That's clear in the passage at 71. Uh, my Lord, the, the, the main authority in this whole area which summarises the, the relevant principles is Adams and Cape Industries, and I'm sure it's a case that uh, your lordships have probably read a number of times in the past because it's such a seminal judgment and it keeps coming up in all the sorts of areas of law. Uh, and that's in Authority Bundle 1, Tab 4. The, the, the background is set out in the head note. Um, it may be simpler if I just give my summary of what the relevant structures were. What happened is that US default judgments were entered against Cape and Capasco. And Cape was a company incorporated in England, as was its subsidiary, Capasco. And Capasco was the marketing subsidiary worldwide for Cape. And we're talking about one of those asbestos doses claims that they're suppliers of asbestos. Um, it was sought to enforce the default judgments obtained in Illinois, in England, on various grounds. And one of the grounds was it was asserted that uh, Cape and Capasco were present in the American jurisdiction in Illinois by carrying on business in Illinois through two entities in Illinois with offices there. One was NACC and the other was CPC. And NACC was the marketing wholly owned subsidiary in the US of Cape. And NACC had the office in, 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 in Illinois and was incorporated there. And after NACC ceased to carry on business. The marketing was done through another entity called CPC, which had been promoted by Cape, and it was also incorporated in Illinois. And Mr. Justice Scott uh, held that the presence of NACC and CAP, CPC in I Illinois and the business carried on by their respective offices in Illinois did not constitute the presence of Cape or Capasco in Illinois, and hence they weren't carrying on business there. So it's a situation where there's a subsidiary, two subsidiaries in Illinois, and they're saying, well, you're carrying on business in Illinois through them, and the, the judge held that that wasn't the case. Um, 
This judgment uh, was cited um, in the judgment of, 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 of the judge, and perhaps we can look at it later at paragraph 391. And for current purposes, I would invite you to look at pages 467, where this whole issue is looked at right through, and I'm not invited to read it now, but the, the relevant uh, pages that deal with this whole issue in Scott's judgment, which is just a Scott's judgment, is um, 467 to 484, and I invite you to read that in full, because it is a very detailed analysis of this area. Uh, uh, all right, that's 467 to 484. Yes, I do. Yeah. Issue 4 and 5. You say the headnote is accurate or incomplete? Or the headnote is accurate but confusing, and that's why I, was, I gave my summary. So, what, what, well, you give a summary of the facts. I'm just saying, what, what is the proposition that you say this case establishes? It establishes that, that it's, it's one of the critical factors in deciding whether or not a party is carrying on business in the jurisdiction is whether or not the agent has power to bind, but as a matter of contract, the principle. And we say that's not present here. Uh, and that that is the, the, the key point, or one of the key points, that you get. And secondly, there's a passage in there, which I cited, page paragraph 67, which lists a number of criteria which the Court of Appeals says that should be taken into account in deciding this issue of carrying on business. Uh, so it, it's a it's a critical judgment. It's referred to below to the uh, okay, well, Sir John Chapman. And this is this is all on the basis that there is no pre-existing legal relationship between the agent in the firm of commerce and the foreign corporation outside the jurisdiction. And imagine a case where a senior employee of a foreign is sent to the foreign jurisdiction, sent to the jurisdiction in question, and negotiates and markets and so on. He has no power to conclude contracts on behalf of his employer. Would the fact that he has no authority to conclude contracts conclusively mean that he could not be regarded as an agent Binding the foreign principle. So you're, you're, you're possibly in a situation where he's an employee held out as an employee of the firm, and can, if he's out out there and he has authority and in fact enters into contracts, then he's not he, into, he, doesn't oh, he doesn't enter into contracts. He negotiates, he makes representations, he markets, but whether there's to be a contract or not is for the decision. Of his employing company, and which will decide either to enter into it or not. He can't. I would say, in those circumstances, he's not carrying on business. The, the, the corporation is not carrying on business within that jurisdiction. Not carrying on business through their employee? No. See, the, what behind that question is really quite obvious. We, we know the bank and um, Saracen within Dubai is a joint venture between Bank Saracen and uh, I think I got this down the right way and a corporation which is incorporated yeah, uh, in Dubai or it's a joint venture between Bank Saracen and Jersey. Jersey. Sorry? I think it's Jersey. It's a Jersey. I think so, yeah. yeah. So you have that connection which doesn't appear in any of these cases. And we have the judge's conclusion that Mr. Nair and Mr. Wagner were indistinguishably acting for the Dubai company and acting for Bank Barrison in Switzerland. And speaking for myself, I'm not sure how helpful these cases are in dealing with that particular factual situation. Obviously, the, the, the general approach in these cases is relevant, but 
are there any authorities that actually come close to the factual situation that we're involved with here? I'm not aware of any authorities which are close to the factual scenario here, save that here, um, well, there is this Chopra that, that, that is, is much closer to, to that scenario that you've given. So we'll go to Chopra once I've dealt with this problem. Chopra is a lot closer. But just, just, just to make one final point, I'm sorry to be delaying. Um, as president of the it seems to me that if an employee of the foreign corporation is in the subject jurisdiction, marketing and um, the negotiating and so on, in order to encourage sales, which he can't get into, but his employer can, that the foreign employer is conducting business through their employee in the other jurisdiction. That's not the way that the, the decisions on jurisdiction have gone. Yes, I understand what the Lord's position is, but if you look at Adams and Cape and the other authorities, is that's not the, the route that they've gone down. No, because the facts have been different. Well, forgive me, I've, um, I, I, I've taken up enough time. No, it's, it's very helpful. Um, well, as I look at Adams and the, what I call the ratio of the cases, to find page 530. Exactly. I was, uh, can I just? Uh, maybe you do have to plow a few pages. One, four, six, seven, four, eight, four. But th this is the uh, the judge's uh, summary of the principles to be derived from the range of authority that he's looked at. Or have I missed something here? I, I don't think. I'd be very surprised if you think this is anything, and I don't think you have on, on, on that. But. Um, I do think it'd be helpful just to look at a few short passages before we get there, and then we can go through what your lordship. I mean, the passage you've been asked, asked us to read is from the judgment of Mr. Justice Scott. Mr. Justice Scott, is it? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm, what I'm looking at is the decision of the Court of Appeal, aren't I? Sure. Which you would have thought why we, where we would start. Yeah. Okay. So, can we look at the? the Cool, good. I'm not going to take you to Mr. Justice to Scott's judgment. I've just said that that's useful background because he does summarise all the authorities in detail and applies them. But if we could go to fa page 524 okay. in the, the judgment of the Court of Appeal, and I, I'd invite your Lordships really to read 524C up to uh, 525E. Thank you. Oh, you, you want me to do it now? It may be helpful to, that it is a prelude to the, the passage that you're, uh, you've highlighted, my lord. Um, but as my Lord says, there is the added complication here of the joint venture. And um, perhaps to some extent, the actual names of the parties. It is slightly surprising that the first defendant is called a bank. Yes, my Lord. Uh, so it, it, if we. And then page 529. 
he, he, he does agree with, the Court of Appeal does agree with counsel uh, for, the, for the plaintiffs in that case, that the existence of a power in the resident agent to bind the foreign corporation contracts is neither exclusive nor conclusive test to the residence of the corporation itself. And then he, he deals with that. But then at D, he says, nevertheless... That undermines your earlier submission, isn't it? Yes, but that's why I'm, I'm pointing it out, which is yeah, to say well, that it, it accepts it's not conclusive. And I say it's a very important fact. Right. Um, and that at D, it says, nevertheless, it is a striking fact that this one possible exception, in none of the many reported English decisions cited to us, it has been held that a corporation has been resident in this country and has either is a fixed place of business of its own in this country in which it carried on business through servants or agents, or has had a representative here who has had the power to bind it by contract, who has carried on business at or from a fixed base, place of business in this country. And then at G, where the representative of an overseas corporation has general authority to create contractual relations between corporation and third parties and exercise that authority, there may be little difficulty in applying the maximum free facet per alien facet per se. Where no such authority exists, there may be much greater difficulty. And then we go to the passage that your, your Lordship is, is quite rightly highlighted, uh, which is at page 530 under the heading B, General Principles Derived from the Authorities Related to Presence Issue. And, and what we've done at paragraph 67 of our skeleton argument. is deal with each of the criteria listed and then apply that to the, the facts here. But looking at the, the, the test at 530, in relation to the trading uh, corporations, we derive three following propositions from consideration of the many authorities cited to us relating to uh, the presence of overseas corporations. One, the English courts will be likely to treat a trading corporation incorporated under the law of one country, an overseas corporation, as present within the jurisdiction of the courts of another country only if either it has an established and maintained at its own expense, whether its own or lessee, a fixed place of business of its own in the other country, and for more than a minimum, minimal period of time has carried on its own business from or at such premises by its servants or agents a branch office case, and we say we're clearly not a branch office case. Or two, a representative of the overseas corporation has for more than a minimal period of time been carrying on the overseas corporation's business in the other country at or from some fixed place of business. Two, in either of these two cases, presence can only be established if it can be fairly be said that the overseas corporation's business, whether or not together with the representative's own business, has been transacted at or from the fixed place of business. In the first case, this condition is likely to represent few problems. In the second, the question whether the representative has been carrying on the overseas corporation's business was being doing no more than carry out carry on its own business will not will necessitate necessitate an investigation of the function which he's been performing and all aspects of the relationship between him and the overseas corporation. And then three, in particular, but without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing. The following questions are likely to be relevant on such an investigation. A, whether or not the fixed place of business from which the representative operates was originally acquired for the purpose of enabling him to act on behalf of the overseas corporation. And just stop in there, my lords, and your excellency. In this case, it's clear that the first defendant obtained the fixed place of business in the DIFC for the purpose of carrying on its own business pursuant to its license. It wasn't obtained for the purposes of the uh, second defendant. Uh, secondly, that C, sorry, whether the overseas corporation has directly reimbursed him for, one, the cost of his accommodation at the fixed place of business, or two, the cost of his staff. And, and here, uh, the first defendant was responsible for its cost of its own operation. Banks Harrison did not reimburse the first defendant for the cost of accommodation and the cost of staff. And the first defendant is an independent legal entity carrying on its own business. And the only contribution they made to the cost of the first defendant was uh, an initial investment at the beginning. And then C, what other contributions, if any, the overseas corporation makes to the financing 
of the business carried on by the representative. And, and we say that we weren't responded, responsible for financing any part of the defendant's, first defendant's business, uh, save for the initial investment establishing the joint venture company. And then D, whether the representative is remunerated by reference to transactions, e.g. by commission, or by fixed regular payments, or in some other way. And what we say is only commissions were payable to the first offender, <coughs> where the second offender accepted and proceeded with instructions from the first offender. And, and so we say that the payment of commission shows that the first offender was carrying on his own business rather than the business of the second uh, defendant. And then E, what degree of control the overseas corporation exercises over the running of the business conducted by the representative? Well, we say that the first defendant could carry on its own business, some of which was marketing products from Bank Saracen, some of it relating to other entities. And as such, we didn't exercise control over the first defendant, which was a separate entity carrying on its own business. And then F. Can I just ask you about that? Sorry. I haven't looked at the uh, shareholders' agreement, but the, this was a 50 50 owned. 60 40, my lord. Sorry? 60 40. So Alpen owned 60%, did they? No, the other way around. So Bank Saracen owned 60% of the shares of uh, Bank Saracen Alpen. D1, yeah. And presumably it had, well, in that sense, had control. Presumably, we were able to appoint the board of directors. I think. Or was there some agreement as to how many directors each side should appoint? Can, can I please just check that while I'm on my feet right. and we can come back with the answer? But, I to mean, that. at first blush, uh, it may not matter, but uh, your, your firm did have control over this company. But it may have control in the sense that if it's 60% um, shareholder may be able to do certain things. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the, the business of the first defendant was our business. And in law, there's a clear distinction between a, even a... Well, there may be some reserve matters which have to be dealt with by those shareholders in agreement. But, uh, but, it, it, but for example, there's a whole host of cases on disclosure, aren't there, where uh, it's said that the documents in the hands of a wholly owned subsidiary are not within the public customization of power of the parent company because you've got to respect there's a, a, there's a, there's a, there's a corporation in between. Um, F. Whether the representative reserves one part of his accommodation or two parts of his staff for conducting business related to the overseas corporation. Uh, and what we say is that um, the first offender, none of, no part of the first offender's of the pockets was uh, related to the use of uh, the Bank Saracen for the purpose of carrying on Bank Saracen's business. The seven, whether the, or G, sorry, whether the representative displays the overseas corporation's well, name. I'm not sure what evidence my learned friend is referring to when he's making some of these submissions at the point about the office, for instance. Where does this come from? Well, they, they, they haven't proved that the office is our office, which is just one of the criteria. Um, if we look at, moving on, G, whether the representative displays the overseas corporation's name at, at his premises or on his stationery, and, uh, and, and if so, whether he did so in such a way as to indicate that he was a representative of the corporation. Uh, the first defendant did have a non-exclusive uh, royalty-free license in the name of Bank Sands in connection with the business in the Middle East. But it had its own brand of uh, Saracen Alpen, and that was on the correspondence. And then H, what business, if any, the representative transacted its principal exclusively on its own behalf? And we say the first event did conduct in the DIC its own authorised activities, including the marketing of and arranging deals and financial products from various party, third party investment banks and financial institutions. And then I, whether the representative makes contracts with customers or other third parties in the name of the overseas corporation, otherwise in such manner as to bind it. And clearly uh, it didn't. It was never authorised to enter into or conclude any contract 
on behalf of Bank Sanse. And, it, and J, if so, whether the representative requires specific authority in advance before binding the overseas corporation to contractual obligations. And then carry on. This list of questions is not ex exhaustive, and the answer to none of them is necessarily conclusive. If the judge was intending to say that in any case, other than a branch office case, the presence of an overseas company can never be established unless a representative has authority to contract on behalf of and bind the principal. We regard this proposition as too widely stated. We accept Mr. Morrison's position to respect every case of this character is likely to involve a nice examination of all the facts, and inferences must be drawn from a number of the facts, just together and contrasted. Nevertheless, we agree with the general principle, as thus stated by Mr. Justice Pearson in the Jabor case. A corporation resides in this country which carries on business there at a fixed place of business, and in the case of an agency, a principal test will be applied in determining whether the corporation is carrying on business at the agency is to ascertain whether the agent has authority to enter into contracts on behalf of the corporation without submitting them to the corporation for approval. On the authorities, the presence or absence of such authority is clearly regarded as being of great importance one way or another. A fortiori, the fact that a representative, whether with or without prior approval, never makes contracts in the name of the overseas corporation or otherwise in such a manner so as to bind it must be a powerful factor pointing against the presence of an overseas corporation. Uh, lords, I've dealt with uh, the, I've listed the, the criterion and our submissions on those at paragraph 67 of our skeleton argument. Just for your logic note, on page 37, at subparagraph 9, we refer to Dyson and Morris, which summarises uh, Adams and Cape Industries. And just to give you the reference, you don't need to look at it. It's Authorities Bundle 7, tab 58, page 2454. Authorities bundle seven. Go on, Danny. Yes. Divide that. Fifty-eight. Yeah. Uh, page two four five four. Yeah. The. Yes. And going back to the the facts of. Adams is, is the NAC, NAAC, as I've explained, I took you to the head note, was, wholly, was a wholly owned subsidiary of CAPE. It was marketing CAPE's goods, but the Court of Appeal held that that did not mean that CAPE carried on business in the US. So although it had a marketing operation, that was done through a subsidiary, and the subsidiary, wholly owned subsidiary, and the fact that that was doing the marketing operation there did not mean that CAPE the parent company is carrying on business <coughs> in Illinois. Uh, well, that's, <coughs> that's Adams. Thank you. I'll order a paragraph. <coughs> 68 um. of our skeleton argument. I deal with. Uh, Chopra against Bank of Sing Singapore. Um, that's an authorities bundle 7, tab 50. Tab 50. You want us to get that? Yes. If we look at, before we go to the authority, if we look at paragraph 68 in my skeleton argument, we say that in, in answer to Sir Richard Field's uh, question, are there any cases which are more akin to our scenario, uh, I think this is probably the, the closest. And in that case, it was held that a foreign bank was not providing financial so services for the purpose of the, the FSMA. And the judge held that uh, the following factors tended to show that the Bank of Singapore was not providing financial services in the UK for the purposes of the Act. 
and we, we list the three things. One, there was a service le level agreement between the Bank of Singapore and its UK representatives, and that, that specifically provided that the representative did not have the authority to bind Bank of Singapore. And the business of the first defendant was said to be the marketing product subsequent to being duly done. Our business, uh, sorry, the business of D1 here, is said to be the marketing of products subsequent to be duly licensed by the DIFC Financial Services Authority. Uh, and we say first offence <coughs> limited authority did not have the authority to bind this uh, contraction. The, the second point that, that stressed in the case that instructions and trainings were being provided to the employees of the UK representatives not to represent them as employees of the foreign entity. And thirdly, the terms of business of the UK representatives made a clear distinction between the UK entity and the foreign entity. Uh, we say, well, we're, we're clearly separate from the entities. But if we could just look at um, the Chopra case, and you can see from paragraph 1 on page 1998. So just repeat the page? 1998. Uh, tab 50. Yeah. On, in June, July 2008, the claimants each invested $200,000 in the bond issued by OSC, OJSC Financial Leasing Company, FLC. The claimants' purchases were arranged by the first defendant, which was called ING Asia Private Bank Limited, AIPB. FLC subsequently defaulted on the bonds. The claimants alleged that the bonds were missold to them, in particular, was IAB representative of quasi Russian sovereign risk and it was not the case. In June 2014, the claimants commenced its claim against IAPB and its parent company. Since January 2010, the second defendant, OCBC, by issuing a claim form. And in October 2014, the claimants prepared or served a claim form on both defendants at OCBC's premises in London. And the, the defendants claimed sort of declaration that they were properly served. And then paragraphs 5 and 6 explain who the defendants were. Um, IAPB, the company registered in Singapore with premises in Singapore, prior to 29th January 2010, it was part of the IMG group of companies. IAPB was not then and is not now registered in the company's house as a foreign company. The defendants contend it did not then and does not carry on business or have any presence in this jurisdiction. Consistently with this, IAPB was not and is not an authorised person under financial services in the market at 2000. IAPB's parent company was IMG Bank NV, a company registered in the Netherlands with a registered UK branch office, which was authorised, which was an authorised person under the FS, FSNF. IAPB shares were then acquired by OCPB from IMG Bank NV on 29th of January, after which IAPB changed its name to Bank of Singapore. And then they say, OCPB, PBC, is also a company registered in Singapore. OCBC has a registered UK branch office with premises of the Rex building, King Street. These premises are leased and paid for solely by OCBC, and all the staff who work there are employed by OCBC. OCBC is an authorised person under FISMA and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority and the Prudential uh, Regulatory Authority. And then at paragraph 99, Uh, you can see that the authority that, that, that they, they thought was the, the key authority in this uh, issue is Adams and, and, and Cave Industries, paragraph 99, where they signed the passage that the Lordship picked up on uh, from the Court of Appeal. And then the assessment is at paragraphs um, 101 to 113. I, I would invite the Lordship just to read those pages now to get the context of that case.
And, and uh, my Lord, I've been asked to just refer your Lordships to paragraphs 78 and 92 by my learned friend. 78. And 92. Uh, my Lord, then if we can put the authorities away. In our <laughs> my Lord, at the at paragraph sixty nine to seventy one, we simply deal with the the relevant provisions in, in England, and I don't think it's necessary to, to actually take you through those uh, at this stage. Um, clearly you have to construe the, the position under the current legislation, but I don't think it, the references I've given are so important that you need to look at that now. The, the next item is dealing with paragraphs 72 and 73 of my skeleton argument. Uh, I don't think it would be particularly helpful just to take you through the rules of, uh, of attribution, as I'm sure you're very familiar with them, but I would just give um, your Lordship the references of paragraph 73, Meridian's Authority Bundle 5, tab 31, and the key page to look at is page 507. And, and seven. As, re, as regards paragraph 74, Bank of India against Morris, that's authority bundle five, tab 35, and the, the key paragraph is paragraph 130, and that considered attribution in the context of section 100, uh, 213 of the Insolvency Act of 1986, which is a fraudulent trading. And then Bilter against UK, which is paragraph 75, that's authorities bundle 6, tab 49, and that's another section 213 case. And the relevant paragraphs are set out there, that's 187 to 190. But we say that attribution is not a determining factor, merely because certain acts of a person can be attributed to another does not mean that the uh, second offender is carrying on business in the DIFC. You need to look at the capacity of Mr. Nair. What was he doing? Was he doing it as an employee of D1? Or was he doing it on behalf of D2? And we say he was doing that as in his capacity of servicing his own client, uh, and he was the client relationship manager under the general terms and conditions. And we deal with this at paragraph 76 of our skeleton argument. So if you look, you can look at paragraph 76, where we deal with the, the Nair point. Paragraph 77, which is dealing with the claimant's submissions, uh, the, the claimants in their skeleton argument, paragraph 431, uh, they, they say that um, the court feels already found that the investment contract between Banks Harris and the claimants were concluded in the DIFC, and they say we're bound by that finding. We say uh, that's wrong. Uh, the first is that you, you you consider there was no performance of any part of the um, transactions within the 
DIFC. And we say it's important to look at more than merely where contracts <laughs> concluded. I don't know where that's coming from. Um, and the none of the key agreements between the claimants and Bank Sarasan, such as the credit facility agreements, were concluded in the DIFC. So far as we're concerned, all the relevant agreements were concluded in Switzerland. That's where we issued the documents, and that's where the documents were returned and where they were signed. And insofar as they were signed by the claimants, they signed them in Kuwait or London. And all that happened was that those documents were being passed through the first amendment as a post box for administrative uh, convenience. But if we can uh, look at the, the judgment of the Court of Appeal, uh, that's in uh, bundle C2, tab 41A. looked at paragraph 77, which is at page 20, 982.0027, and if we look at paragraph 55, 3, Paragraph 55 on page 21. It thus appears that in substance the relationship between the claimants and Saracen Dubai and Saracen Switzerland is one which had the following salient characteristics. And, and then they then you list a number of factors. And three, in the course of its marketing function, Saracen Dubai offered advice to the client, to the claimants, either from its own judgment and or from information or advice obtained from Saracen Switzerland. Four, the process of investment management was conducted by Science and Switzerland and or Rabobank. And in the current custody application form, Science and Dubai is designated as the external advisor in relation to the claims and therefore must have been an agent, intermediary, or subsidiary of Science and Switzerland appointed by special authorization or other special consent or agreement to act as so called designated representative in accordance with the agreement in the Swiss Bank's Code of Conduct with regard to the exercise of due diligence. In that capacity, South and Europe will have a function of ascertaining the precise identification of the applicant and verifying all such information to satisfy the obligation for large design to prevent money laundering from which, which South and Switzerland had assumed under Swiss Bank's code of conduct. And then paragraph 56. The claimants therefore dealt with two component entities which combined together to provide it with both the credit facilities and the acquired investments. In this dual exercise, the role of Saracen and Dubai was to market and advise upon the investment products and was also to act as a, in a ministerial capacity in order to procure the execution of all the necessary documents. In that capacity, they were not the claims agents, but they were acting as part of Bank Saracen and Banking Group for the purpose of processing, negotiating, administering credit and investment transactions on behalf of Saracen Switzerland. And then we've got the passage we looked at before at 70, 77. And the claimant in their skeleton argument, uh, there were now paragraph 78 of our skeleton argument, the claimants in their skeleton argument rely on Mr. Burnley's evidence that the relationship between the first defendant and Bank Sarasat did not operate as it was supposed to do. But uh, merely because it didn't operate in the way that it was firmly expected does not mean that the bank's house and contravened the financial service prohib prohibition. We need to look at was bank's house and conducting the four specified activities found by the learned judge. And in, in so carrying out those activities, was it carrying out carrying on business in or from the DIFC? And we say it wasn't. And you should appreciate that the claimants on one level, the clients of both the first defendant and Bank Saracen. And what was in reality being, do, being done, the advisory part of it, was being done by the first defendant. And we were the ones supplying the product. 
And in so far as documents needed to be signed or transmitted, the first defendant effectively acted as a communicator or a postbox rather than uh, substantively. Paragraph, paragraph 79, the, the claimants have, have listed uh, instances in paragraph 1 where they say that the first defendant and, and Bank Sarasac operated as one operation. And we list what the arguments are against that. And I think I'll be, I've made these points generally as I've been going along. But I would invite you to look at paragraph uh, 79. And, and what we have to face is, is that the judge at first instance held that the acts of Mr. Nair were indistinguishable uh, from what he would have done if he was employed by the second defendant. But we dealt with that point as we've gone along. And you have to look at it and see exactly what acts were being done, what specified activity was being done, and was that being done by us, the second defendant, or was it being done by D1 under their own licenses? The, I'm about to move on to the next topic, uh, which is Article 65 and the reasonable uh, belief uh, defence. And also, if we can look at a uh, bundle G1 tab 82, Page 4616. I'm so sorry. Could you give the record? Yes, it's um, G1, tab 82, 4616. Thank you. Sixty-five, unenforceable agreements breached by party to the agreement. Subject to Article 65, 5, a person who makes an agreement in the course of carrying on a financial service can breach of the financial service prohibition or the collective investment prohibitions shall not be entitled to enforce such agreement against any party, the relevant party, to the agreement. And then two, subject to an agreement that may otherwise be reached between the parties, the relevant party may apply to the court to recover A, any money paid or property transferred to him under the agreement, and B, compensation reflecting any loss resulting sustained by the relevant party as a direct result of such payment and transfer. And clearly for the damages here, there's, there, there, there are arguments on what this means and how it's going to be construed, and presumably that will be dealt with if, 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 if there's an appeal on the, on the, on the quantum judgment. I understand that the Chiefs have indicated that you would rather hear submissions on uh, quantum uh, at this hearing. But if we look at subparagraph 5, this is the key provision. If the court is satisfied that the person carrying on the financial service reasonably believed that he was not in breach of the financial services prohibition or the collective investment prohibitions by entering into such agreement, and that it is fair and just in the circumstances to make an order, it may make one or more of the following orders. A, an order that the agreement be enforced between the parties to such extent and under such terms and conditions as the court sees fit, or B, an order that money paid or property transferred under the agreement be retained or dealt with in accordance with the agreement in such matter as the court deems fit. And then seven, article six, in Article 65, the agreement means an agreement the making a performance of which constitutes or is part of the carrying on of a financial service. The test of reasonable belief of subparagraph 5 does include a subjective element. Did the second defendant in fact believe it was not breaching uh, the financial services prohibition? And we, we say clearly uh, we did not believe that we were breaching the financial services uh, prohibition. And I invite your lordships to uh, look at uh, the, the relevant passage in Firth, 
uh, on uh, financial services. And that's an authority bundle. Um, seven, tab 56. This is merely dealing with the English test, which the provisions are, the comparable provision is section 28 of the Financial Services and Markets Act. And this passage is simply dealing with the relevance of legal advice. Uh, and it says, whatever, it's page four, 2437, yeah. it's tab 56, yep. And it's solely dealing with the relevance of legal advice. Uh, so what is this first? For derivatives law and practice. Yeah. And the dealing with section 28.5 of FISM provides that determining whether it's just and reasonable to allow a transaction entered to by a person breaching the authorization requirement to be enforced, the court must have regard to whether he reasonably believed he was not acting in breach of that requirement. It says well, it would normally be possible to show such a reasonable belief that the seller acts on legal advice that the transaction did not involve it in carrying on regulated activities. And then there's another, then look, look at the last few paragraphs, the rest of the paragraph, on this, if you can uh, read that. What is worth it. It's just simply dealing with is it relevant that you took legal advice? It's not dealing with the test uh, generally. And then, can we look at Watersheds and De Costa, Authorities Bundle 5, Tab 41? On the head note, you can see it, page 1555, financial services were being, financial advice was being given in relation to raising of funds for the defendant's company. And that one of the arguments raised, as you can see from the bottom of page 1555, was that the agreement was unenforceable by reason of section 26 of FISM, article 25 of the relevant order, because in respect of the contemplated obtaining of equity finance, the claim of had been engaged in carrying on a regulated activity, namely making arrangements for with a view to the sale of shares, whilst being uh, not authorised to do so. Uh, the judge rejected uh, the, um, the grounds of the defendant on a number of grounds, and he did not find that there was any breach of the regulatory uh, framework. But if you look at subparagraph 3 on page 1556, uh, the, the court held at the end of three, five lines up, that even if it had been, that activity was incidental to the provision of financial services and the claimant was able to claim exemption under section 327. So in any event, this would have been an appropriate case for the court to exercise the discretion under section 28 of the 2000 to permit the claimant to enforce the agreement and that accordingly the claimant was entitled to the sum claim plus interest. And the, the relevant passage in the judgment is at paragraph 83 and 84, where the learned judge said, finally, this is page 1578, even if I'm wrong in all of my conclusions and water checks were in breach of the general prohibition, I will regard this as a proper case to exercise my discretion in section 28 uh, to permit water checks to enforce agreement. First, Mrs. Green told me that she believed that all material terms and indeed still believes 
that Watershed grow exempt. That was the advice she had from her principal, who told her that she had made a number of calls to the ICAEW and would be advised by them that a DPB licence would suffice to cover all Watershed's activities, and she believed it to be correct. She was entitled to rely on from what she was told, and in my view, it was reasonable for her to do so. Moreover, her evidence before me demonstrated uh, an awareness and broad understanding of the most relevant, relevant provisions of the complicated legislation. I do not think she simply took her superior's word and thought nothing, no more about it. I accept her evidence on this point. Indeed, it was not channeled. Since she is the senior person most actively involved with the work with the defendants, I think it right to regard her as a person whose plea is relevant for the purposes of Section 28 of the And then, I then have to consider the other circumstances of the case. The following are, in my view, relevant. First, and contrary to my above conclusions, the unenforceability defence is well founded. The defendants are, of course, entitled to rely on it. But when it comes to the exercise of my discretion, it is relevant to note that none of the criticisms of watersheds have anything to do with whether or not watersheds were acting in breach of the general prohibition. And that's interesting because here, none of the findings made against my clients have anything other than that we're acting in breach of the general prohibition. There's been no finding by the judge that we've breached any other, any other obligation towards the claimants. Uh, their real complaints are that Watershed misled them about the fees to, which would be charged, failed to alert them to their potential personal liability, and they did little or nothing to earn their fees, failing to secure any funding, and so causing fa failure to defend its business. The un unenforceability defence was not raised until the proceedings had been underway for some time. Um, and it's the same here. They weren't raised until one month before the trial. Secondly, although the defendants now complain that Watershed's advertising material did not include an appropriate warning as to the limits of, on their work and say the inclusion of such a warning would have deterred them from entering from any agreement with Watersheds, their evidence on this point did not persuade me. Mr. De Costa told me that he'd been impressed by Mrs. Groom's attitude and Mr. Jefferson told me he was similarly impressed. I find it difficult to accept they would nonetheless have decided not to engage water chairs if the warning notice has been published. Thirdly, no investment was in fact made and no investors have lost money after the breach of the general prohibition. Moreover, the company was never intended to be an investor. It was, in, it was to be the beneficiary of the investment, which shows it's all very fact-specific as to whether or not the reasonable belief defence applies. We can put that case away, my lord. So, uh, does this effectively lead um, an open ended discussion to the court? 